Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Connie Yowell. Uh, I am the Director of Education at the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's conversation. And I am uh, very eager for the discussion today because I think it poses just a wonderful context uh, for a discussion of connected learning. Often I think uh, it can be a great way to push an approach or a way of thinking um, is to use, such as connected learning, is to examine a set of present day tensions or problems. Um, and to ask a question like, can a new paradigm uh, provide useful insights to a present day problem? Can it provide a different way forward? Uh, can it resolve existing tensions in a manner that perhaps we haven't thought about before? So for today's discussion, we thought it might be really interesting to take a look at a set of tensions that were at the heart of recent discussions in Chicago. And I want to be really clear uh, that we, in no way in today's conversation, want to weigh in on the actual events uh, in Chicago or on how the direction that it took or on its resolution. Rather, we simply want to unpack some of the tensions that were in play and to see if connected learning provides a new frame or a lens in which to understand or resolve these tensions for the future. And I'm uh, really thrilled that I have four great individuals to join me in the conversation today. PJ Carafalo joins us from Chicago. PJ has taught math for many years in Chicago public schools and is now the curriculum coordinator at Walter Payton High School. Michael Robbins joins us from Washington, D.C. He's the Senior Advisor for Nonprofit Partnerships at the U.S. Department of Education. Joe Kahn joins us from California and Mills College. Uh, Joe chairs the MacArthur Research Network on Youth and Participatory Politics, among other things. And Erin Knight joins us from Maine. Erin is the Director of Learning at the Mozilla Foundation, where she oversees their work on badges. And I, PJ, I want to start with you. I'm wondering, can you start us off and launch us into uh, this conversation by uh, giving us, uh, from your perspective, what you saw, some of the core tensions playing out in Chicago that we can then uh, begin to unpack from the perspective of connected learning and, and see where the conversation takes us? Sure, and thank you very much for having me. Uh, so I am a Chicago Public School teacher. I still teach a class as curriculum coordinator, and that gives me a foot in sort of both worlds, seeing things a little bit from the administrative perspective, a little thing for a little bit from the teacher perspective, a little bit from the perspective of someone who wants to improve our practice within our school, and also as a parent of two children in Chicago public schools and a four-year-old who will be in Chicago public schools in a couple of years. So I sort of got to see issues during this two-week period from all sides. Um, a couple of core issues that came out are there is a demand that teachers do more and that teachers try to teach better and that te teachers also try to bring in more outside resources and more enriching kinds of activities. In the first draft of the, full, the longer school day, now called the, the full school day proposal that came out last February, uh, Jean-Claude Brizard challenged teachers and uh, challenged schools to come up with plans for not just regular, ordinary instruction, but to expand the school day and to expand the offerings to create enrichment. Um, our school took up that challenge, and we created a really great program that I think does that. But that, the tension then raised the question of, like, we want teachers to do more, and we want them to do more exciting things, but at the same time, a lot of the ways that we are still measuring teachers are using traditional standardized tests. And frankly, when we're asking teachers to do more, there isn't always more money to pay the teachers to do the more. And so one of the early tensions that came up last spring was, a request that teachers work 20% longer days and get 2% more pay. So that was an issue that came up. And, and, and in general, when we want more things to happen in schools and around schools, we have to also deal with the fact that we have finite resources to make that happen. A second tension that came up I just alluded to is this issue of evaluating teachers. Uh, and in particular, what do we want teachers to do every day in the classroom? And how do we evaluate them to make sure that that's happening? Uh, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's a fact, not even an opinion, that the old evaluation systems that we had in Chicago and a lot of other districts didn't really make sure those things happened. Uh, there frequently were checklists of very simple items, and if you walked into a classroom and a teacher was teaching something that was basically the subject they were supposed to teach, they got a good evaluation. 
uh, regard, and they got the same evaluation whether they were doing the most amazing lesson you ever saw or just, you know, something, you know, look in the back of the book and do five to 37 odds. So, um, so we need an evaluation system that supports teachers who are trying to do more creative things, that encourages teachers to think outside of traditional boundaries and uh, to really go that extra mile to help their kids learn. And so another tension is what would an evaluation system like that, that, that encourages teachers to do that look like? And then the final piece that came out is that there are dramatic inequities in the schools. And, um, you know, during the strike, we had this experience of coming together as teachers and having conversations with teachers from very, very different schools. I, I'm very fortunate that the school where I'm at, uh, although we are the least funded school on a per pupil basis in the city, we have incredibly generous parents and families and community members who are able to give us the things that we need to, to do with the things that we do. So I'm talking to you right now from a distance learning lab uh, where we have TV monitors and we can connect to universities and people throughout the world. Uh, the school across the street from me doesn't have a gym. And the kids in that school, when they have gym, this is an elementary school, uh, they literally have gym in their classroom uh, once a week for an hour. And that's what PE looks like at that school. So uh, another thing that came up is trying to make sure that as we make these gains, and we do more and more things to give our kids a better education uh, and maybe a more complete education, that those are really coming out to all students and not just to the students who happen to get into the Walter Paytons and the Whitney Youngs and the Stuyvesants and what, whatnot. Thank you, PJ. That was incredibly helpful. Um, so as we look at these three big tensions that PJ has laid out, Michael, do you, can you give us some insight from your perspective um, and the position that, that you're working from and, and uh, from Connected Learning about how you might begin to think about these tensions and grapple with them? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, PJ, and thanks, Connie. Um, you know, we, we talk about these tensions all across the country in the context of our work uh, to help strengthen partnerships between schools and uh, community-based organizations. Uh, particularly focused on how those partnerships can help uh, propel school improvement. And so we bring together groups, you know, whether it's at the request of superintendents or mayors or other folks or at national conferences to, to start working through this. And one of the first things we ask them to do is to, uh, is to draw a diagram, just a simple diagram of what they uh, view as their school community partnerships. You know, pick a school, maybe the school you work, in maybe the school you work with and draw what those partnerships look like. And typically, uh, I'm going to try to do a, a, some advanced uh, stuff here. Uh, typically, what we get is a, um, a picture. Michael, we can't hear you. We can see you. There you go. Michael, we've seen the picture. All yeah, can you come back? I'm not sure we hear you and see the picture. We've seen the picture. Hey, Michael. OK. So we try. I just want the audience to know we did try this before and it worked. Oh, there he is. Oh, You've here got, I am. Okay. All right. So just you know what what we usually get is a diagram. Where okay, he's frozen. Hey, Joe. Yeah. Okay. Good. So Joe, I'm gonna move on to you and then come back to Michael. Sure. As he's as he's uh, getting his connection figured out. So Joe, you work. Um, and the, you work a lot with youth, and uh, your area is uh, often with civic engagement and service learning. And as PJ laid out some of those tensions, I'm curious, and you've been working uh, with the connected learning work for quite a while, I'm curious what came to mind and, and how you think about those tensions. So I, I think uh, a bunch of things came to mind, and I also would love to put a few things on the table in addition, just because we are sort of right at the right in an election season. It's, it's such a moment to be talking a bit about uh, about the needs for civic and political engagement, and I think it hits 
at the tensions that PJ just laid out because we're sort of saying in the midst of everything you're doing and all that you're doing now, there's something really important, this presidential election. How do you make sure young people are ready and effectively engaged and informed in relation to all of this? And that becomes a whole new set of demands on a system that is already, you know, as PJ laid out, uh, you know, people are maxed out in terms of what they can deliver and how they can do it. So we really have to think about what are some of those new requirements and how do we address them. Um, one of the things that we've seen in our study of youth and participatory politics, in fact, is that the very nature, just as uh, opportunities for learning are shifting dramatically, the nature of civic and political life are shifting dramatically. So there are a lot more opportunities for young people to engage in different ways, both around things like fundraising uh, but, uh, and mobilizing others to do things, but also around uh, learning and circulating and, and creating, producing of information and sharing their perspectives with one another. So uh, together with Kathy Cohen and, uh, and with uh, several other colleagues, uh, John Rogowski, Ben Boyer, uh, Ellen Middle, and Chris Evans, we conducted a, a survey of the country taking a look at participatory politics. And I'll just throw out two sort of statistics from that survey that I think can inform some of the, the needs that we have and then cycle back to sort of what does that mean for schools and community organizations and for young people. So we found out that a relatively small percentage of people, maybe 15% of young people, are playing a role circulating, producing information, trying to drive the conversation related to civic and political life. But that roughly half of young people, 45%, said they got news and information at least once a week from Twitter or Facebook feeds from their friends and family. So a lot of information in relation to civic and political issues is coming not from the traditional news sources of schools and uh, mainstream media, but is coming fed through the mediation of their peers and their family. And I think that highlights some of the reasons why we really have to be careful and be thinking about how do we support young people in engaging in these ways so that they can do it thoughtfully and effectively. And the last statistic I'll share was that we asked young people whether or not they felt they could benefit from learning more about how to tell whether the information they find through these sources online is trustworthy. And 84% of young people said they could. So what we're seeing is a huge demand for young people recognizing the challenges and the, as well as the opportunities that these media present and trying to figure out how best to manage them. And that's going to really take a kind of partnership between, uh, as folks were saying, between what schools can deliver and what uh, what community institutions can deliver, as well as ways in which we can create uh, frameworks and structures and platforms that allow young people and young people and adults to interact in ways that meet, meet those needs. So, uh, for example, uh, in Oakland right now we're working with the school district uh, to try to promote civic and political engagement and education around that that moves beyond the traditional government course, which has been traditionally heavily a a sort of course that focuses on the three branches of government and all of that stuff, which is not unimportant, but probably isn't sufficient. And in doing that, we're really trying to think about and trying to work to develop powerful partnerships with community organizations, as well as ways to bring uh, connections to digital platforms into play for young people so that they can continue their education uh, both uh, online uh, in their discretionary time, as well as uh, enrich the education that they have when they're connected with community organizations or in schools. Uh, and, and I'll just say uh, one thing about that that we found in one of our earlier studies was that when teachers do that, when, when educators help connect kids to those opportunities that are online and in community organizations, we find that young people are much more likely to continue to pursue and engage in those ways during their discretionary time afterwards. So we think that that kind of a partnership can lead really in a bi-directional way where the work that they do uh, in informal space or in, with community organizations can feed and support the work they do in schools as well as the opportunities they get in schools supporting and enriching their ability to learn outside of those contexts. Thanks, Joe. Um, Michael, I want to welcome back. Thanks. And I want to cycle back to you because I think Joe raises a, a bunch of very important points that make me reflect on two of the tensions that PJ raised. And one of them is uh, the idea that teachers need to do more. 
which was sort of one of the core tensions, uh, as well as the question of inequalities. And it seems to me that as we uh, focus more and more on education, and I put education in quotes, that uh, as an education community, and I consider myself a part of that education community, we look more and more and more to the single teacher to provide everything to the student. Um, and part of the, one of the core premises of, the connect, of connected learning is to focus on learning as opposed to education with the idea that education, typically we understand it as happening only in the school building and learning happening more broadly uh, everywhere. And I'm wondering as you uh, reflect on some of the tensions that PJ raised, uh, I think Joe was really speaking quite eloquently about what students and also uh, some of the online opportunities can bring to the equation to perhaps relieve teachers of some of the quote unquote burden that they may feel as being the sole provider of education um, as well as a community and it seems to me that it might be helpful for us to broaden the, the uh, responsibility uh, and understanding of where learning happens but can you tell us a little bit about what what PJ was tensions made you think sure I mean, my um, my colleagues at the department will, uh, will tell you that I'm the one that is constantly reminding them that we're the Department of Education and not just the Department of Schools. Uh, and so, you know, I would say that, you know, it's not just that we're not talking about learning, we're talking about education. I'd say that oftentimes we're not even talking about education, we're just talking about schools. Um, and, you know, some of this actually comes from uh, of, you know, very positive developments in education. You know, um, this, you know, so-called whatever you uh, choose to name it, the, the no excuses movement where, you know, schools are being accountable for results uh, inside the classroom, inside the school building, regardless of what uh, is happening with the child outside. And, and that's a positive development. But, you know, in the process of that happening, um, there are blinders that have, have gotten put up uh, even more. and. And I think, you know, teachers and, and school leaders are have forgotten that, you know, yes, they're accountable for results, but in order to really be successful, they have to look at their role in connecting uh, all the assets in a child's life in support of learning. And so, you know, I, I think that we're not going to overcome you know, this this reality of, of teachers really in, in many places, you know, stressing at the seams until we can transform, you know, how we view uh, teaching so that it's really about this relationship and this cooperation that happens uh, between uh, teachers, parents, uh, community organizations, and the students themselves uh, to drive both student engagement uh, and uh, academic achievement. Um, I want to come back to this question of what it means to transform how we view teaching because I think that is probably a very uh, core question for us to get at today. Uh, but before doing that, Erin, I want to touch base with you and, and I hear a little bit about what uh, TJ's laying out of the um, tensions made you think and uh, particularly given your work on badges, if, uh, if you could say a little bit about the evaluation slash assessment tensions that PJ raised that we know are just so critical to this and, and will be a core part of this conversation going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just as a, I guess, a um, foundational statement just for people that are listening in, um, when we're talking about badges here, we're talking about um, digital records of achievements, skills, interests, affiliations. Um, the idea is uh, sort of an alternative credentialing system um, that can recognize the various um, skills and achievements that both students and teachers can have um, in this connected learning ecosystem. Um, so uh, with that um, perspective, I think I wanted to comment once on, uh, on what Michael was just saying about, um, uh, and, uh, and Joe as well, about uh, really uh, kind of confronting the teachers doing more problem by um, creating these partnerships or connecting them with um, with other organizations. And I think that badges um, is a piece of this. Um, and we talk a lot about badges as connectors. Um, and so that they are, the, the again, the sort of recognition or the record of um, the various experiences that 
people are having across various organizations so that they translate or transfer back. So for example, um, you know, kids could be going to after school programs or museums um, or churches or what, what have you and, and be learning things, having these learning experiences and right now there's a big disconnect um, between uh, taking that back to schools and teachers understanding what they learn, what they're good at, et cetera. And so I think that that is part of the pressure that the teachers feel because it's just a black hole to them. And so um, if we think about uh, incorporating badges as this recognition system, suddenly that becomes um, a more transparent system where, again, the, um, the information is passed back and forth and, and that can become more of a web of learning instead of um, these silos. So that's one piece. Um, but then on the second tension, um, that PJ was talking about about needing a new way to evaluate teachers. Um, I think this is a this is a, a sort of a sweet spot for badges. And uh, I should say up front that badges are not the answer. Uh, they're not the evaluation itself, but they are the recognition um, piece of this, so that uh, we can start to actually recognize um, individual things that teachers are doing. They might even be very small. They might be um, you know an innovative hour that they take. Um, each day or each week, um, and and really start to legitimize that. So it's it's not just about being accountable for results, um, but it's about starting to create these um, these sets of of badges uh, or again these kind of records that that start to tell a more comprehensive story about what this teacher is good at, um, what they're trying to do, what um, some of the kind of big wins that they've had. So. Um, again, it's, it's about starting to legitimize those experiences and then again, once we have some of that in place, you know, teachers will start seeing the badges of other teachers and, and it will start to, um, uh, start to kind of uh, open up that, that system for what we value and what, um, what we tell teachers that we value. Um, and, and I think there's a piece here too that flows back to the students and again, badges are not going to solve the way that we um, evaluate students or you know just multiple choice tests but but again um, badges are giving us the flexibility to start to record more incremental types of learning and and um, celebrate and and recognize um, more of the learning pathway that that kids are having and so that again gives teachers a lot of flexibility to start to um, be a little bit more innovative um, start to you know kind of insert some of those um, creative that creativity um, into into their their daily experiences. PJ, I'm curious if you uh, what you think of uh, what Aaron just said about badges and and how they may or may not be helpful in some of the tensions that you laid out. Yeah, I think they would be very helpful if I can get like sort of classroom teacher wonky for a second. Uh, uh, and just say, like, I think the, one of the biggest problems with what we're doing in teaching, both from the perspective of the teacher side and per, from the student parent side, is that our, our traditional model of assessment, what parents call tests and quizzes uh, or grades, is, is really not very functional. Michael, you and I were talking about this yesterday from the student side and also from the teacher side. Um, you know, a kid gets a, a quiz back, my daughter, my daughter gets this quiz back, say, and she gets an 87 on it or she gets a 78 on it. Like, that is not actually useful information for her. Does that mean that she knew 87% of the material really well and then there was 12.5% that she didn't know? Or does it mean that she knew m almost everything something about it, right? She knew, <laughs> she like kind of had a B on everything, but, you know, she never didn't really nail anything. I mean, you just don't know. And it certainly doesn't give her any feedback on what she should be doing to improve her grade, right? Because it's just a number. Um, now, my daughter is lucky, or if you talk to her, unlucky, that she has teacher parents. So I can sit down with a quiz with her and say, well, look, you know, and I can dissect what happened. But it's not very transparent. It doesn't tell me what the teacher values. It doesn't tell me what the teacher wants to have happen in the big picture. And it doesn't... Uh, tell Emma what she needs to do to do better. So we started this thing last year that was uh, we, an idea we stole from some other people. It was trans... Oh. Oh, no. So much for PJ's high-tech room. OK, so he will come back, I'm sure. He's in mid-thought. Michael, I know you had some thoughts related to both data and transparency, given what Aaron was talking about. 
Yeah, so you know, where he and I talked about this yesterday, so I can fill in a little bit to get to where I, I would talk. You know, it's it's actually looking at um, at you know mastery of different competencies and you know, not not even necessarily having a grade assigned to those. It's that yes, you've you've figured out how to do uh, fractions. Yes, you figured out how, how to do uh, X, Y, and Z. The, the thing that that does from a partnerships perspective is incredibly valuable because now you know now a parent uh, can look at this and say okay I know exactly what it is that my child needs help with now someone uh, in an out of school time program uh, can can uh, you know with the parents and students uh, agreement see the same thing and then you know we have a whole host of, of digital learning resources. You know, open education resources and others that they can then be marshaled to help uh, you know fill in those particular gaps. So uh, PJ's return. PJ, I was just talking a little bit about what you and I had talked about about you know that data then being a key to unlock uh, the power of partnerships with parents and and community partners. A absolutely. So I, I'm not exactly sure I faded out, but what I was saying is you know you have these you you lay out ahead of time what you want the kids to know. And then what you do is you say, this is what we want kids to actually, you know, this is what we want kids to know, this is what they're graded on, and their grade is not how many homework assignments they turn in or whatever, it's just how well they do on these standards that we've articulated. And that's, I think, a place where the badge system would fit right in on the, on the student side, because it allows for kids to experience learning in other environments and bring back to their teacher's evidence, yes, I've mastered this objective. It doesn't have to be about what happened with you in that classroom at 11.47 on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So, and then I think, you know, you take that, uh, now, now on the education policy side, you know, you take that same idea over to the teacher evaluation section. And, and, and if I can sit on my, uh, soap uh, I sit on my soapbox for another minute, I have two graphs to show about this, you know, we're a lot of talk now about, um, about the value-added metric as a new way to assess uh, teacher learning, uh, uh, teacher growth, and, and, and teacher competence. And the idea is roughly that you don't just judge kids on where they end up, because they might have started at different places, but you give a pre-test either at the beginning of the year or at the end of the previous year, and you give a post-test at the end of the current year, and then the student growth as measured by the difference in those two test scores becomes effectively the, the teacher's value-added score. And it's a very alluring idea, but at least as it's practiced, it sort of falls prey to all the different things that we were just talking about with student scores. Um, so I'm going to share a, a, a graph with you guys. Uh, here it comes. And this graph is based on, uh, on the data from the New York scores that was released in the New York Times. Uh, it was produced by a, another teacher, uh, Gary Rubenstein. Each dot is one teacher in New York City. On the x-axis, this horizontal axis, is their score on uh, the, the, the metric uh, from 2009. And the y-axis is their score in 2010. So this dot that I'm pointing at here on the right side is a teacher who got an almost perfect score in 2009 and was in the, about the 15th, got a 15% I guess, I guess these are percentiles. So it was in the 15th percentile in 2010. So one year was one of the very, very, very best teachers, and the next year was one of the very worst teachers. And you'll notice that there are a lot of dots down here in this mm -hmm. lower right-hand corner. And there are a lot of dots up here in the upper left-hand corner. Right? So these are teachers who are not getting a consistent message from these scores, because presumably they're doing much the same thing from year after year. Certainly, if I was over here on the right side in 2009, I wouldn't change my practice that much because the systems told me I'm doing a great job. And then about a third of the time, I wind up down in that bottom graph. Um, one more picture here. Well, that's, uh, that's not it. That's a cool picture. There you go. Uh, this is a, a different version of that graph. Uh, this data pulls out the teachers who are doing the same, the same teacher teaching the same subject at the same grade level. So nothing changed. They didn't go from fifth grade math to seventh grade math. They didn't go from fifth grade math to seventh grade reading. Right? It's, this, it's everything that's possible has been held constant. And again, these dots are scattered all over the place. 
So it tells us that these methods aren't giving teachers the kind of feedback they would need to improve their performance because they're not giving any kind of consistent feedback at all. So I think that it, one thing that came out of these discussions is an idea that we need a, a metric that actually, again, and badges would be a great way to do this, mm -hmm. that actually reflect what teachers are doing and what we want them to do. We don't want them to teach kids how to do multiple choice tests because once the kids are 25 years old, that's a useless skill. Right. Those are daunting graphs, PJ, and that was very, I really appreciate that. Um, Joe, what is that, connect that a little bit for me, because I think there's, uh, there's uh, that is an imp incredibly important statement, both about how we treat and engage teachers and how we want to uh, talk about paying attention to uh, accomplishment and recognition. Um, and then also, how do we want to make uh, connected learning talks a lot about the best kind of learning happening when we connect peer culture, interests, and academics. And a lot of your research uh, speaks to the interest and the, that, that relationship to academics uh, and to civic and interest. And so I'm wondering if you can bring some of that conversation to bear on a little bit of what PJ was just referring to. Sure, sure. I'd be happy to try it and to uh, also make a link to badges in, in relation to this because I think certainly the tensions that are being exposed here around the challenge of having evaluation structures that, that we actually can get good guidance from is enormous. Um, and at the same time, I think we, one of the real strengths of connected learning and of the digital media is the potential for it to bring and expand our notion of audience. So one of the things embedded in those graphs is an idea that the audience for a child's work or a young person's work is really an authority structure that has figured out what are the priorities that matter and how can we score them. And I think one of the things that peer culture and the broader audience tells us is that what people produce, especially in informal space, is being produced not only to please uh, you know, the standards or the, uh, the centralized notion of what kids need to know, but a, but a much broader group. And I think both of those are valuable, and the two of those together can be very valuable. So if we think about one of the things that badges can do for young people or, or that ways of making public and holding in a digital way the work that students do is, one, it gives them an audience, and a, a, often of peers, sometimes of families, and communities that they care an awful lot about, and that creates new incentives uh, as well as real reality checks, both for the kids and for the teachers, about whether what's being produced is valuable. And I think that speaks a lot to PJ's comment about we don't just want kids who know how to do well on a multiple choice test, we actually want kids who know how to produce something that's compelling and thoughtful and, and based on principle. Um, and, and I think that there are lots of ways, certainly in the civic space, but I think in education more generally that looking at young people's production and looking at ways to share that production through badging systems and other means can be very powerful. We're certainly beginning to experiment that with Oakland, in Oakland and in other places whereby young people are producing stuff that then is getting feedback not only from the teacher but from a variety, you know, from peers and from others, and that that can be both a motivation for learning as well as a very authentic way to assess stuff. I want to cycle back quickly to your question about interest. A piece of that also, one of the risks, I think, of the centralized evaluation system is that it can marginalize concern for students' interests. Mm -hmm. And so part of what the challenge is, I think, for all of us as educators is figuring out how do we leverage those things that young people care about are already doing and understand and forge powerful connections to much of the curriculum that we think is also important for them to know and frankly that they will find can help them pursue those interests more powerfully. And what we found in our research of course is that, and this is hardly just us, when people connect to young people's interests you get better work and you also create pathways that can be quite powerful to what, what we think of as desired practices. And so I think that's another place where connected learning where lear and, uh, and learning in a variety of environments can really create new opportunities for leveraging connections to those interests. I'll let any of you jump in if you, if you want to grab the 
the big picture on the Hangout. But Aaron, I did I did want to make sure you got a chance to say a little bit both about how badges exist and sit within communities, and also how they, uh, following on what Joe just said, help uh, multiple pathways to learning uh, to both exist and be leveraged, which I, I think seem to be a really important themes here. Yeah. So um, yeah. So Joe mentioned the word centralized, and I think that's um, that's a, a key word here. Um, and I think that uh, again, one of the the opportunities with with badges is really to to sort of decentralize um, learning to to really um, open it up where um, the the learner can actually define various pathways, kind of going back to some of the stuff that PJ and Michael were saying before about defining competencies and then allowing people to essentially um, find ways to um, master those competencies. And so it really, um, again, uh, is, is this more distributed model where there isn't one way you have to do things, there isn't one type of learning that counts, um, but there are a lot of opportunities for, um, for learners to really be in control of that. Um, and then, and I think that naturally plays into this concept of of community and um, how kind of critical that is um, for learning. And again, this, uh, this is a beautiful um, hangout because everything's tying together perfectly with the the uh, diagram that Michael showed before about it's not just about a school, but there's um, there's this whole set of partnerships and communities around it. Um, and that's the reality of the way that. Um, that people learn. You know, it's both local communities, it's, it's communities online, it's also the reality of, of the world that teachers uh, work in as well. And, um, and I think that, the, again, another, another benefit or opportunity with badges is um, a couple things. One is that um, it starts to help us formalize some of the reputation and identity that, um, that is, you know, already occurring in communities. It, it sort of takes it to the next level. So it really helps um, kind of forge your place in the community, start to um, demonstrate the things that you've done, the skills that you have, help you find mentors, really start to make those connections within that community. But it also um, gives us an opportunity for the things that we decide to badge or the things that we decide are important to emerge from those communities as well. So there's that flexibility aspect where um, we can really let these kind of these communities of practice or these local communities that, that students are working in the whole connected learning concept start to um, define the things that we that we're going to value by community and, and if, again there's going to be big crossovers um, you know there, there will I don't think we'll ever get rid of you know some type of description of like here's the universe of kind of core competencies but but there's a lot of flexibility to really start to um, to align those or or customize those for various communities that um, that our students are living in, that our teachers are living in, that um, that really are the place for a lot of this to to really blossom um, in a in a very personalized way. Good. Can I uh, can I jump in here on that? Yep. Um, and then so PJ. Yeah, so Aaron and, and, and Joe, you know, bring up a, an important point that this is about, you know, being connected about uh, students, you know, exploring their passions and, uh, and their learning in uh, community settings as well. But, you know, there's a, there's a shift that's going to have to happen uh, on both sides of the equation, both with schools and with community partners in order to make this effective. Um, I, I first want to mention a couple terms that I think get in the way of this shift happening. Uh, one of them is uh, is after school. You know this idea that there's in school and after school, and certainly, you know the department's programs around 21st century uh, have helped reinforce that. Uh, hopefully, uh, the changes, the shifting over to uh, to expanded learning time uh, through our ESEA waivers process will uh, give some opportunities to to fix that. Um, the the second term that I really think gets in the way is uh, wraparound services. You know, when when people in schools talk about uh, partnerships to support their students, you know, they they tend to to relegate uh, these partners to things that are essential. Uh, you know, students have to be uh, fed, they have to be clothed, they have to be healthy uh, in school. Uh, they have mental health needs, transportation needs, other. But it, it, it's not at the core mission of student engagement and learning. It's they, they get marginalized through this term. And so I, I think that we need to, to look at you know, other ways to do that. You know, I, I think that 
also just looking at tutoring and mentoring. Uh, you know, that those are very important things, but they tend to just be the default rather than let's look at what are the core things we need to do to engage students uh, and then to help them learn. And then on the community-based organization side, too often the default for partnerships is someone goes to a school and says, we'd like to give 20 of your students dance lessons. And uh, because the school needs all the help they can get, they say, uh, sure. Uh, and so you end up with this mishmash of partnerships that aren't really aligned to school and student needs. So you know, there are things that need to happen on both sides of the equation. Schools need to, to really embrace um, community uh, organizations and parents as partners in accomplishing their core mission. And then um, parents and community organizations need to be responsive to that so that when schools are able to articulate what the, the real needs are that they can, uh, can uh, align with those. And, you know, j jumping back in, one issue that comes up again is centralization here because if our picture right now is that the school and the teacher are sort of the nexus where all the learning is supposed to go through that person, um, then that, I mean, that makes the teacher not just the point of contact, but frankly the bottleneck. And, and I say this, like, for my students, I'm the bottleneck. Um, the outside of school services that my kids use the most and get the most out of are the ones that maybe I alert them to and then I shut up and they go and take care of themselves. We have a fabulous partnership with UIC and their math program. UIC, that's University of Illinois at Chicago for non-Chicagoans, uh, they run that. And I don't have to do any management. And then my kids can really access it. Um, you know, we talked earlier about trying to get teachers to do more and, and so forth. But the reality is that uh, teachers in schools are already doing so much and are responsible for so much that we've got to get out of this additive model of there's this other thing, we want you to do this other thing. We really need to, you know, to use a word that uh, you used earlier, Connie, and, and some of the other people used. We have to think about this in a transformative way. We're not just going to add a couple things, and we're not just going to take away a couple of things. We're going to sort of rethink how this education piece works, and that's one of I think the strengths of this community partnerships. Again, with badges model would work is that um, by saying learning is taking place in a lot of different arenas, and then. The teacher's responsibility is to facilitate at least some of that learning and also to help the students organize what they're doing. But it, there's all these other groups and resources the students would be using uh, outside of what goes on in the classroom. And it's not necessarily up to the teacher or even possible for the teacher to put a strict, you know, strict pathways for A, B, C, or D, or E, what's going to happen. So PJ, I'm going to ask you a question and then certainly it, everybody else uh, feel free to answer, but it's the question that I always get so I want to pass it on to you. So what do you see as the role of the teacher in the future? Oh, that's really hard. Um, I mean, I think the teacher is there uh, to help students come to grips with what they don't know and what they need to learn. And I think the te it's very important that the teacher have uh, information about and access to a bunch of resources to make that happen. I think it's really important that the teacher know the content well enough to be able to make those judgment calls. I mean, all the stuff I've talked about sounds very formal. Oh, the teacher can point the kid to this website or this website or this thing or this group. But the reality is that, you know, when you look at a student's paper uh, or whatever work that they've done, project, whatnot, if you don't know the content, you can't, you're not in a position to sort of tell, even help the student identify what they're doing wrong, or what they could do better, or what's great about what they did. Uh, so, so it requires that background knowledge. So I see the teacher in this sort of facilitator role where they're deeply engaged with the student's learning, but that they're not actually doing all the teaching. Uh, one, of my, one of my friends who's a great teacher always used to say, I'm not a teacher. That was his, his mantra 20, 30 years ago because he really saw his role as creating experiences and moments where learning would occur, not as being the sole provider of learning. I'm actually writing that down. That was, thank you. Does anybody? <laughs> and, and I'm sorry, let me just say one, one more thing quickly. You know, I mean, the power of this kind of approach, I, I had a great parenting moment yesterday with, and again, it's hard being a teacher parent, but my son was really concerned because he wanted to play football. And he's in third grade. He's playing flag football. He wants to play tackle football. And I said, no. 
Um, I, you know, every, every family chooses what risks they're going to let their kids run, and I said no to that one. Uh, and he got really mad at me, and so finally I said, Jonah, go on the internet after dinner and you've done your homework and do some research and you come back and present me the figures that show me that this is safe and we'll talk about it. And so he went and he did some research and he came back and said, well, this many people were injured and this many people were killed and wow, it's way more unsafe than I thought it was. <laughs> so now I have to teach him about relative proportions versus absolute numbers because he doesn't have a good sense of that. But that was so much more powerful than anything I could have told him. Uh, yeah. That's great. Yeah. You know, uh, PJ, can you also talk, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, sort of how this change in approach might help solve our human capital pro, mm -hmm. you know, problem in teaching, where right now it seems to be designed around creating superhuman teachers. Oh gosh, I'm so glad you asked about that. Um, you know, I saw the movie Waiting for Superman, which I have to admit I really didn't like, uh, but I, there was something about the title that's truthful, which is that we have this picture of teachers as being these incredibly super amazing people who are going to do all these things, and we our focus in education for the last you know 20 years has been to produce more of these super teachers. You know, I, I'm very fortunate. I have great students. I've won a couple of awards, and so people go, "We need more teachers like you," and I say, "We actually don't." Um, I've been in China for now on two trips visiting some of the best high schools in China. And they're great schools, and they're great kids, and the teachers are so-so. Um, and, uh, and, and I love the Chinese schools, and, and, and I think they would admit that too. So I hope I, any Chinese listeners here, I'm not offending them, uh, because I'm really impressed by what goes on in the Chinese educational system. When I come to sh Chicago and I'm talking to my kids here, every student of mine can tell you about a year in which they didn't learn math. Mm -hmm or a year in which something, somehow nothing really happened in their science class, maybe they read a couple things out of the textbook. And I go to China and no kid has a story like that. And I think what China has figured out that we need to learn here in the United States is that you can't educate an entire population by having great teachers. You educate an entire population by having no terrible teachers and a lot of mediocre ones. And I, what I say is here in the United States what we need more of is more mediocrity. And then some of the great special, special sauce stuff comes from the outside, comes from these, uh, from these partnerships. Right? They can provide some of the stuff you know, that a motivated, excited teacher who isn't the best math teacher and isn't the best science teacher can help their kids access. Instead of trying to say, we're going to fill our, classroom, or fill our classrooms with teachers who are amazing STEM experts and who love poetry and who are amazing, you know, motivators about history and social studies, right? I think we need to acknowledge we're going to have teachers who can teach actually, you know, solid lessons every day, and the really exciting stuff is going to come from a lot of other places too. So then I'm going to ask a question from the live stream, uh, which is a natural segue. How do we create the infrastructure for this to happen? What, what are the first kinds of things? So we've, it seems clear that badges are a core piece of the infrastructure that needs to happen. But if we really want things to be happening from the outside to, to support, what are the other things that we need in the infrastructure to make this happen? And I think this also gets to your equity question. Uh, the tension that you raised earlier, PJ, which I also wanted to ask about, is, is making sure that we attend to the, the question of inequalities across the schools. Because that really is an infrastructure question. Yeah, I mean, I, so we're, we're talking about infrastructure for building partnerships, and we've had, uh, I think, some good um, experiences with this, uh, with the work of our office around our Together for Tomorrow initiative, uh, which we've done cooperatively with the White House and the Corporation for National and Community Service. For folks that want to learn more about that, I'll, I'll share a link. It's uh, tft.challenge.gov. Uh, but one of the things at the core of trying to, to drive change is building capacity, um, particularly with low-performing schools, you know, recognizing that principals have endless to-do lists, and you really need a full-time person in, in most instances in the school who's focusing on these issues. Uh, we recognize in some instances that person may work across multiple schools, but you know, we also uh, have seen instances where it even works better for this person not to be a an employee of the school because 
those are the positions that tend to get cut first. Uh, those are positions that tend to get reprogrammed in the school day if there's urgent needs. You know, so I think one of the key uh, components is, is first starting uh, by building that capacity. Yeah, I would second that. Uh, I'm part of uh, a new Illinois STEM coalition that's trying to do some of this around science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. And uh, one of the things I found out is that some organizations in Chicago, like the Shedd Aquarium, actually have full-time employees whose job is to push these things out to, uh, to schools because they recognize that teachers don't necessarily know what's out there, don't, and there isn't that sort of informational infrastructure in place of identifying what's being done and how it can help the teachers accomplish what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and so one thing I wanted to mention that um, Connie brought up as well um, is this concept of, of the hives that, that we're working with MacArthur and um, other organizations to build. And, and it's um, so the, one of the biggest ones is in um, New York City right now, and we're working on um, various ones like Toronto and Pittsburgh and London. And the idea is, um, is kind of creating these networks of, of organizations that and institutions that um, kind of work together under this kind of common purpose. And so it doesn't mean that the organizations are teaching exactly the same thing, um, but it's, it's that they want to um, essentially create these, these um, communities or um, connected learning kind of ecosystems um, in a local way. Uh, and are checking in with each other again. Are um, going to be it's going to be very easy to uh, incorporate badges there where they're sharing across. Um, often there is um, some funding model so that they can um, the organizations can get uh, small grants to actually do innovative things. Um, and again, it's 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 hyper local. So um, so there's lots of connection with with the schools themselves. Um, there's lots of crossover between uh, kids in, in that like kids will go to multiple of these organizations um, and just again really starts to formalize that concept of, um, of these learning communities, this ecosystem and, and these various um, these various partnerships that, that, that are just very real within students' lives. Yeah, you know, I think one of the other barriers that we face right now is that people just don't yet really understand what the what the potential partnerships can look like. Uh, we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem with you know, the the concepts and the fact this is moving so quickly and entrepreneurship is is struggling to catch up. We have you know unprecedented investment in in uh, digital learning technology, but we don't have corresponding investment in the systems and processes we need in place uh, to make that happen. Um, we brought together a group um, last year to address this particular issue of blended learning partnerships. Um, I'll just uh, share the link here uh, with folks, and so people, if they're interested in learning more about you know, some of the models we identified, uh, that's a, an option to, to dig a little bit further. Good. I, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Oh, sure. No, I'd love to jump in and cycle back a little bit towards some of the other issues related to equity, because I think we've all been pointing to it in different ways, and and to, I think it's important for us to also um, just highlight some of the strengths and weaknesses or the relative strengths and weaknesses of teachers and schools in addressing equity concerns and of connected learning in addressing some of these, these concerns, because I think it's not like all the strengths are on one side or the other. And, and I think what, what PJ said at the opening, of course, you know, both resonates, we all know it's true, and it's incredibly powerful. And in some schools, the inequities around, you know, for example, what you get for gym are just o overwhelmingly problematic. Um, and certainly some of the supports and infrastructure that exist in various schools varies dramatically, and that will influence their ability to tap the opportunities of connected learning. But let me say a little bit first about what I, where I think connected learning can really help us. If, if we look, for example, at some of the survey data related to things like access, um, you know, we found in our survey that basically 95% of all youth and the differences across, say, racial categories were minimal, have access to computers within, or to, to the internet. Um, sometimes they vary on how they access it, but the inequities there, even around something like broadband, are quite minor compared to, say, the inequities in a lot of, you know, the differences between, say, suburban and urban schools in terms of funding and things like that. When we look at kids' interests, 
uh, and at the degree to which they're engaged online, again, many of um, many of the inequities are uh, are much much smaller than say some of the inequities around the ways that people engage with uh, academic content. So there are ways in which if we can tap levels of engagement in these informal spaces, if we can tap some of the uh, resources that exist in communities, we can, and, and young people's core interests, we get a much more equal base from which to build towards education. That said, even if the, the inequities aren't structured by socioeconomic status, not all kids are getting access to many of the things that we want. And so one of the things that I think teachers in schools play a key role in is not just facilitating, though clearly that's crucial, but also making sure that even if your parents never talk about uh, politics, that somebody in school does so that you have an opportunity to engage with that. Even if uh, in, in your community or you don't happen to have a big interest in art or someone who can help you in math, well, there's someone in school who can raise those issues, point out the importance of that, and connect you to opportunities. So I think there's a, a, the fact that schooling is universal, or at least is universal up until kids start dropping out, which is obviously a huge problem, does provide a different kind of safeguard around the equity agenda that's crucial, but so does connected learning with respect to some of these other dimensions. Thank you, Joe. That was, that was a really helpful framing. I appreciate that. We are almost at the top of the hour. This has been a fabulous conversation. I really appreciate uh, everyone's engagement and your thoughts. It's been uh, really, really uh, thought-provoking uh, and helpful. I want to give you each uh, just a minute to sort of say your final thoughts and as, we, as we fade out. Um, so, Erin, I'm going to start with you if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I want to I want to uh, reiterate what you just said, that this has been a fantastic um, talk, and I think it just shows, um, you know, we're, we're all coming from kind of very different um, uh, access points, but we're all sort of talking about exactly the same issues and, and often about about exactly the same uh, solution. So so that's really promising to me. Um, I came here to represent badges, so I, I will say that um, I just want to reiterate that badges are not the silver bullet and badges are not, like we're not trying to say that badges are the solution, but I think that badges are a piece of it, that the idea of recognizing um, uh, skills and achievements both on teachers and student side and, um, and tying the, that back to uh, sort of immersing that across these various communities and, um, and really uh, letting that, that kind of information transfer across these various organizations, institutions, is, um, is, a, is a really big piece of this. Erin, will you share, uh, so that John can share it out, where people can find out more information about the badges? Absolutely. OK, great. Thank you. Michael? Yeah, um, I mean, this has been a fantastic conversation. This has been a fantastic conversation. Um, I think you know, what we're really trying to do is shift culture around education. And uh, if we're successful in moving forward, the things that we've been talking about here, you know, it's, it's really changing uh, ownership of learning. Uh, it's, it's making it uh, so that you know, students own their own learning, parents own uh, the learning uh, for their children. Uh, in that you know, we really start to foster a community culture of education success where it's not seen as just having the schools with the responsibility uh, for, for moving this forward, but that it's, that's, it's everybody's responsibility and that the corresponding piece of that is we have better answer question, how can I help? Excellent, great, thank you. Joe? Well, again, I'd like to thank everybody and really have enjoyed this conversation. I think the, uh, the thing that just really feels true is that there's a growing recognition of these possibilities and of the importance of moving in this direction. And it's really clear, I think, as Michael said, that there needs to be a cultural shift. It's really clear, as many people have highlighted, that we need to start developing the infrastructure. And clearly, we have to... Uh, begin experimenting and figuring out, you know, how to make this work more effectively with some some degree of scale, and and that's going to be exciting. But I think it's going to clearly continue to move forward over the next several years. So thank, thank you, Joe. PJ, bring us home. Uh, well, it has been an amazing conversation, and I think I'm leaving with sort of two thoughts about where we need to go. And the first is that we need to 
achieve more clarity about what we actually want to accomplish. Uh, the Common Core Standards, which we could, of course, talk about for a whole hour, are one effort to do that uh, and to think transformatively about how we want to change math and, and, uh, and literacy education so that kids have the skills they need to go forward. But we need that kind of clarity across everything. Right? We need to say, you know, yes, we want badges, but we want badges for the following reasons. This is what we want kids to be able to do. And so at the same time as this conversation about broadening things is going on, we need to have another conversation that really sort of focuses our attention on what it is that we want kids to know. And then the second piece of it is that we need to be really transparent about all this stuff. I mean, one of the things that came up again and again uh, in these conversations is the amount of communication that's going on uh, and bring that communication out so that um, when, and that's communication about our goals, communication about our progress towards those goals, uh, and then communication about what kids are actually doing and how we can reflect that in their learning process and in their learning outcomes. Uh, so greater transparency and a greater sort of clarity of vision about what we want kids to, to be doing and thinking about and how we want them to be doing those things. Terrific. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, we have shared out some links so people can follow your work. And also, if folks want to keep today's conversation going, please continue using the hashtag the Connected Learning hashtag on Twitter. You can also go to the archive section on www.connectedlearning.tv later today for a full recording and other curated content. Also, I want to let everybody know that the next webinar will be Thursday, October 25th from 10.30 to 11.30 a.m. Pacific time with teacher David Preston and his students talking about the transformative power of open source learning. And I look forward to that one. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.